Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Kegebein with the Garland County Library, and today's program is Country Doctors of Arkansas, which is another episode in the ongoing collaboration between the Garland County Library and our partners at the Garland County Historical Society. And in today's program, which features guest presenter Dr. Sam Taggart, Dr. Taggart's going to profile rural doctors from across the state in the pages of his recent book, Country Doctors of Arkansas. Before Dr. Taggart begins his presentation, there's some brief opening remarks to be made by a couple of members of the Garland County Historical Society. And if at any point during the broadcast you have any questions or comments that you would like us to share with Dr. Taggart, don't hesitate to share those in the comment section there and we'll address them at the end of the program. So it's my pleasure to introduce Hot Springs native Julie Brenner Nix, who currently serves as president of the board of directors of the Garland County, County Historical, Historical Society. Society. Welcome, Ms. Nix. Thank you, and good afternoon to everyone. We were really hoping that we were going to see your bright, smiling faces in person, um, but it seems there have been other plans made for us. So here we are, again, thankful that we have the broadcast from the Garland County Library, and maybe next month we will see you here. Um, other than saying welcome, um, that I don't have a lot to tell you today. Um, maybe two of you would be interested in the fact that we are getting ready to undertake a strategic planning process uh, at the Historical Society. So that will be one of our major projects for the winter months. Um, the other thing is um, I just wanted to share with you, if you are a member of the Historical Society, you have this in your hands, uh, which is it's the 20. 21 edition of the record, which is the official journal of the society. Um, if you don't have this in your hands, that means you're not a member, but you can either go on the website or come by the society and purchase one. Um, it's a whole lot easier just to be a member and then you get it in the mail. You don't have to get out. You don't have to put your credit card in the website. So anyway, we're excited. It's a great publication this year. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Robbins, who's our executive director, and she will introduce Dr. Taggart and make any announcements that she has. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. On Tuesday, January 25th at 6 p.m., the Arkansas Highlands Folk Project is going to present a program called Getting to Know the History of Garland and Montgomery Counties on its six virtual Facebook Live presentation. Charlie Moore is going to moderate, and uh, his guests are going to be Barry Mickey, the director of the Heritage House Museum in Mount Ida, and me, and we're going to share some little known facts and talk about some misconceptions about our local histories and uh, talk about how people can use our resources, what resources we have, and just talk about all kinds of interesting historical things. Charlie will also provide an update to his search for the missing history of Washita Old Town Mountain Music. Apparently, there's some intriguing recently uncovered promising resources. And you can view that program on the library's Facebook page or YouTube site at six o'clock, January 25th. The Society's next program will be next, it will be in February, February 15th at noon, maybe in person, we'll see. And it's gonna be given by John Archibald, well-known Arkansas publisher and printer. He's gonna give a fascinating look at newspaper coverage of Arkansas epidemics of the 1800s. And of course, this is such a timely topic, talking about epidemics. He's going to tell how newspaper coverage changed during the 1800s with an emphasis on the 1895 information war between Hot Springs doctors and the national media during our smallpox epidemic. He's also going to demonstrate some of the news gathering processes used by Arkansas publishers in the 1800s. Now, today, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Sam Taggart. He's from right here in Arkansas, from Augusta, Arkansas. 
He worked his way through medical, uh, through college at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, and then attended medical school at the University of Arkansas Medical School in Little Rock. He got his medical degree and completed a family practice residency, and then the Army took him away for a couple of years. But thankfully, he came back here to Arkansas, where he's practiced medicine and lived in Benton and Hot Springs for the last 40 years. He retired in 2013 as the senior partner and founder of Family Practice Associates of Benton. He's a very talented man. His first novel, We All Hear Voices, won the National Bronze Prize for Popular Fiction from the Independent Book Publishers Association in 2010. And in that year, he published his second novel called With a Heavy Heart, which tells the story of a German spy at Boxhide and Hot Springs during World War II. He was also commissioned by the Arkansas Times to write a history of health care in Arkansas for the last 200 years. It's called The Public's Health, and it is a wonderful book. He lectures on the history of health throughout Arkansas and writes for the Journal of the Arkansas Academy of Family Physicians. And we're really delighted that he's here to talk about his most recent book, Country Doctors of Arkansas. Sam? Thank you, Liz. I will now take off my mask. <laughs> Okay, very good. Now, what I need to do right now is I need to hit this little button right up here to go to, there we are. Okay. Uh, this Country Doctors of Arkansas is a subject that is very close to my heart. Okay, like many of you out there who are listening. Okay, I remember clearly the Country Doctor of my youth, or the Country Doctors of my youth. And in 19, or excuse me, 2012, when I was working on the public's health book, Dr. Joe Bates, my, my mentor, uh, we were editing and he said, Sam, he said, there are a lot of really wonderful doctors out there who live in real small towns, who labor away in relative obscurity. And the only people who know anything about them are their patients and a few very select colleagues. And he got to talking about Stone Herd from, from um, not Clarendon, but the other, uh, the other little, little town right there close. And he just waxed eloquent about Stone Herd for a long time. And I got to thinking about that. That would be fun to spend some time writing about these people and going out and talking to them. So over about a two and a half year period, uh, we identified 60 country doctors in towns of 2,500 to 5,000, okay? And went around the state, interviewed them, did videos, and those videos are all archived at, those videos, interviews with transcripts are all archived at the Historical Research Center, at the Med Center, at the Country Doctor Museum, uh, at two or three other places, the American Academy of Family Physicians up in Kansas City. When we started the project, we thought we were going to be interviewing a bunch of old white men. That was what, that's what we thought we were going to do. And very quickly, we realized that that was not going to give a clear picture of what was going on out there. And so we, of the 60 people we interviewed, 45 ended up in the book. <clears throat> the oldest, the guys over 75, and by the way, at that time I was under 75, so 75 and older was old, okay? Uh, we're all old white guys, okay? people who were between 55 and 75, uh, you started seeing a smattering of women and physicians of color. And in the group from 55 down, it just, and that's about a third of them. It's increasingly more women, increasingly physicians of color and less old white guys. Okay. Because that's a reflection of what is really out there. Okay. And, and so it, it just, it's been a, it's been a great deal of fun. The book has turned out to good and to be honest with you, and Liz and I were talking about this the other day. The most gratifying thing about this book is that all the guys in the book like it. Oh. <laughs> the ones, the ones we wrote about, they all like it. By the way, you'll see on the cover, J.P. Bell, M.D. He was the he was the photographer. If you ever go into a bank of the Ozarks anywhere in the United States, all of the photography in the banks of the Ozarks are done by J.P. Bell. Okay. 
And he was a, he was an ER doctor up in Fort Smith. He retired to Fayetteville and he had a, an, he had a, an amazing uh, love of trains. And so he went all over the country uh, photographing trains. And he called me when we started doing this project. He said, I'd love to do the photography for you. So he was responsible for a significant part of the videos. Now, do I hit enter to make for the next slide? Okay. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this project, and I get asked this question because I do probably three or four or five presentations a month, is who is the first country doctor in Arkansas? Who are these people? And interestingly, you ladies can't see this slide, but I show a picture in the, in the, the, the people are watching of a medicine man and a woman, a shaman woman. Probably the very first country doctor in Arkansas was 10,500 years ago. Okay. You might say, how in the world did you figure that out? How did you think, how, how, how could you say that? Well, in 1974, Frank Sloan, who owned a farm on the bank of the Cache River in east in western uh, Greene County, called the Arkansas Archaeological Survey in Jonesboro and said, look, we found a, a site and there are a bunch of people out here going through it. We need, we think you need to come dig this site. Okay. And they went out there and they dug this site on a high sandy bank above the Cache River. And what they found was an organized cemetery. Okay. That means these people weren't a hunting party. These people lived there. It all dated to 10,500 years ago. If it was organized enough that they had a, that they had a uh, cemetery, then they had a healer. And most of the time it was the priest slash healer. Clearly all around the world, the very first doctors were not men. They were women. Okay. The men were out scavenging and occasionally hunting for something. They didn't drink beer at that point because beer wasn't invented yet. <clears throat> okay. But they were out hunting and scavenging. The women uh, gathered, picked, <clears throat> took care of the children, took care of the lame and took care of the infirm. So they became the, became the repository of, they became the repository of health. Okay. Uh, now, if you fast forward about 10 millennia, okay, nine or 10 millennia, you'll see that the American, that the, the, the native Americans who occupied Arkansas when the Europeans arrived had a very complex pharmacopoeia. They had drugs that they used that they derived from biologic symbols like plants. Okay. From clays, from therapeutic waters, like, hot springs. Okay. They, they mined salt from the rivers. Okay. So these people had a very complex, very complex way of viewing life. Okay. And any attempt that we make to, to identify them as savages, uncivilized is absolutely incorrect. It's just absolutely incorrect. <clears throat> because they had a very complex way of living life. And from a public health standpoint, Liz and I were talking about this earlier, from a public health standpoint, they probably were a whole lot better than their European counterparts. Okay. Because they believed in cleanliness, they bathed. Okay. And they did not use their campsite to put their human waste. They went away from their campsites. The Europeans didn't do that. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. When, when Arkansas, or excuse me, when the United States bought uh, the Trans-Mississippi, Louisiana and Arkansas from the French who had stolen it from the Spanish, who had stolen it from the French, who had stolen it from the Indians, okay? There weren't many people here, okay? Probably no more than two, maybe 3,000 people, mostly uh, Native Americans. There were a, there was a smattering, probably 55 or 60 um, African-American slaves, uh, and they're just a, maybe two to 300 Europeans, mainly trappers and hunters. Okay. So they didn't have doctors. There had been a couple of doctors who had come in with the Spanish and most of them gave up what they were doing. 
when people started to come in and, and every 10 years after 1804, the population of the Trans-Mississippi, Arkansas doubled. So if you start with 4,000 in 1804 by the Civil War, there were 6, 600,000 people in Arkansas. Okay. Who were their doctors? Well, the very first doctors, okay, I think clearly we know this, were the granny doctors, okay? They were the herbal, yar, called YARB doctors, Y-A-R-B doctors. Uh, Ella Dunn is a really good example of that legacy. And she was in the northern part of the Ouachita's, uh, excuse me, the Ozarks, uh, and up close to, uh, to uh, Missouri. Uh, but she, and there is a tradition in that part of the country, Melbourne, uh, Yaleville, all up in there of herbal doctors who, who still practice up there. Okay. Uh, a second form of doctor was the midwife. And one of the people that I have a picture of in my slideshow is a lady named Dizzy Branscombe. Okay. Dizzy had 15 children and then decided she'd be a midwife. Somebody said, Miss Branscombe, what qualifies you to be a midwife? <laughs> and she said, well, hell, I had 15 kids. <laughs> Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Okay. And so she was, she was a valuable asset. And as many of you know, there are a lot of Branscombs up in the Northern Ozarks <clears throat> and in Southern Missouri. And I had an opportunity to talk to many of her family members or not many. I, I talked to several of her family members as we were writing the book. A third form of the um, of the granny doctor is exemplified by a lady named Caroline Dye from Newport. She's a hoodoo doctor. She took care primarily of uh, the African American population, but that was not the exquisite. She, and her, if you look at her, um, if you look at her uh, her burial stone. It says that she was born in about 1813 and died in 1935. Probably not. Somebody probably used that name. An interesting thing happened with Caroline Dye to show you how valuable she was to the community. She lived at the very end of the, um, the very end of the trolley line in Newport. And so many people were going out there that they built another trolley stop to her house just to get patients to her. Okay. Uh, anyway, Caroline Dye is a very interesting lady. And so is Daisy Branscombe and so is Ella Dunn. But these ladies, these are the first people. If, if you, if you, if you got a problem, the first place you turned to was your family, not some doctor you didn't know. Okay. You turned to these folks and most of these people, I do not know about Caroline Dye, but these other ladies were literate. Okay. And they used books. Okay. They had books that were the family medical compendium. And one was called the family physician. And there were any number of those kinds of books. Uh, as Arkansas began to develop, as more and more people came, <clears throat> the initial population was over and around Arkansas post. Okay. Cause that's where people could get to. And they didn't have to cross that horrible swamp with all those gigantic mosquitoes. And by the way, people don't pay much attention to it, but it wasn't just the gigantic mosquitoes. It was the gigantic horse flies. Okay. We had judges who were sent to Arkansas who got off the boat next day, got back on the boat and said, I ain't going back. Okay. All right. <laughs> but the population centers began developing along the old Southwest trail from Cape Girardeau going to Mexico, which is about where Fulton is now. Okay. That's where it started. Okay. This is, and, and every place where every place where the where the the path of the trail crossed a river, they'd start something. They'd put in uh, a post office. They'd put in a liquor store. They put in <laughs> a rooming house. Okay, and pretty soon a doctor would show up. Okay, or somebody calling himself a doctor. I found two books that are just absolutely wonderful about these early, early doctors. One is called The Odd Leaves from the Book of a Louisiana Swamp Doctor. And the other is called Life and Adventures of an Arkansas Doctor. Arkansas spelled with a W. Okay. And these men, these young men, most of them were 16, 17 years old. 
There was no requirements. There was no licensing. They would precept her with a physician. And then after he felt like they had learned enough, okay, then he would turn them loose on the community. But he always encouraged them to go to the next community and not stay in that community because he didn't, they didn't want the competition. <clears throat> As time went on, mid 19th century, mid to late 19th century, we began to see an appropriate amount of physicians. The training wasn't particularly good, but one of the things that began to happen is that you developed a town, somebody would go there. And if he went there when he was 16 or 17 years old, these guys would stay for 40 and 50 and 60 years. The country doctor that we all remember. Okay. Now there were any number of traits that define these people. And this is true up until today. And what I'm showing is a picture of what you're seeing on the slide is a picture of a guy named Mike Verser. Okay. And y'all may not know who Mike Verser is, but he's a country doctor in Mount Ida, Arkansas right now. Okay. And he was born and raised down in Southeast Arkansas. He was rice farmers. He went to, he went to college and didn't do too well and decided he'd be a rice farmer. Then when the economy tanked in the eighties, he went back to college again. He said, well, it wasn't near as hard that time. <laughs> and he ended up, and he has made the conscious decision to return to a small town. And that's true of country doctors in the past. I'm pretty certain it's going to be true of country doctors in the future. Country doctors are trusted by their patients because they're part of the family. They go to church with them. They go to school. Their kids go to school together. Their trust, they trust these guys to do the right thing. And probably as important as doing the right thing, they trust these guys to be there when they're needed. Okay. They're just trusted. I mean, that's a really important characteristic of the country doctors of the past and of today. One of the things that I've always kind of suspected that was, was true, but one of the things we found, because when we did all these interviews, I'd go around to the towns and I'd ask these guys, I'd, I'd go to the coffee shop and I'd say, well, what do you think about Dr. Thorne or Dr. Or Dr. Bishop? He says, boy, he's the smartest guy I ever knew. Okay. They, they think they're doctor and oftentimes they're right. He's wise. He's wise enough to know when he doesn't know he's wise enough to help them with what he, and they understand that he doesn't have all of the latest technology that is necessary for sometimes. And they trust him to be wise enough to send them when they need something else. And by the way, you, you ladies in the room can't see this, but I'm showing some pictures on here of T.E. Ryan and T.E. Ryan was a doctor in Thornton, Arkansas, and he was there forever. And he was absolutely loved. We threw a, we had, we did a, a presentation like this a couple of a month or so ago and his daughter was there. Okay. She's now a much older woman. And, but there were 60, 70 people showed up and they weren't all old people. Okay. They were people who just knew his name. They knew who he was. The country doctor, the family doctor, the general practitioner, you can use any of those names. They're not necessarily interchangeable, but they're pretty close is there from that first gasping half breath of life till the last half breath sigh. Okay. That's what their job is. That's who they are. That's what they do. And, and that has been true since I suspect back with the native American doctors <coughs> in 10,500 BC. Most, country doctors, not all, but most, because I've had a couple of people correct me on this. Okay. Have a quiet voice, a warm smile and a soft touch. Okay. And the quiet voice, the warm smile and the soft touch are part of the therapy. There was a Dr. Kirby from help from Harrison who, uh, it's, it's been said, uh, 
it had been said that when he, he would make his rounds, he would go out to the country and see people at five o'clock in the morning. He'd come in the house and go, how y'all doing? And nobody wanted to disappoint him. <laughs> so they would say they were doing better whether they were or not. Henry Hernsberger, who was a psychiatrist in Little Rock, talked about the quiet voice and the steadying still in the middle of a storm that Dr. T.E. Ryan was. That his, that his approach to patients was therapeutic. And I think when I look back on my life, I can see that and I can see that as being true. Uh, if you look at the world literature, looking at country doctors, even the darkest, most pessimistic uh, writer, Eastern European and Central European writers like Chekhov and Dostoevsky, okay, write about the doctor in a positive way. Chekhov's country doctor is a very positive profile of a man, and it could be a woman, but a, a man who is an important part of the community. And also that person is the narrator of the story. He's the father confessor. Okay. And increasingly as time goes on, the doctor is the priest of technology. Okay. This didn't happen. It used to have to be true, but it is now. Uh, I can tell you that when, when, when for the last 10 years of my practice, I would have patients come into my office and with a piece of paper in their hand, they'd say, I got this down off the internet at 10 at two o'clock this morning. Don't you think this is right for me? Okay. Well, it's the, country doctor. It's the doctor who looks at the whole family to be the priest of technology. How do you use this? How do you use this technology for, for your health, for your family and for your community? Okay. Having, having new Lord, we'd love, love for every little community, one, two thousand, one or 200 people to have an MRI scan, but is that really necessary? Probably not. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> doctors running families. I looked very carefully throughout the, throughout the several years I've been working on this project for the longest lineage I could find in the state of continuous practice. Okay. There you have the Kirby's out of Harrison. You have the Debrells out of Fort Smith and Al and Almar. You have the Smith family out of, out of Paris, Arkansas, but nobody comes close to Lorenzo Gibson of Scott, Arkansas. Okay. He came to Arkansas in 1834 before Arkansas was a state. And as of a year ago, he still had one of his descendants practicing medicine in Benton, Arkansas. Direct. Okay. The doc doctor was Frank Tebow. Frank is an OBGYN or was, he's retired now. Interestingly, the office, the very first office that Lorenzo Gibson had was in Scott, Arkansas at the Scott plantation. And when we, when I called Frank and I said, Frank, we need, cause he's a friend of mine. I said, we need to do some photography of you. Okay. And he said, well, why don't we go over to Scott plantation, do it over there? Well, he shows up at the, he showed up at the, at the photo shoot in costume and in character of his great, 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 great grandfather. And it was the most wonderful, delightful afternoon. Okay. But it was really, it's a really uh, very interesting. And, and, and you see this, uh, I just came across another family, the, the co uh, Cobbs from Clarksville. They have a, a long history, not quite as long, not quite as long as the, as Lorenzo Gibson and the Tebos. Uh, there are two doctors and I have a slide here, specifically of these two men, Dr. T. E. Ryan <coughs> and Dr. John William Morris. McCrory, Arkansas. They lived about the same amount of time. They started practicing in 1890 and they lived and they practiced and, and both of them very, very similar kinds of practices. Ryan was in Thornton, Fordyce and, and John William Morris was in McCrory. Interestingly, on John William Morris's 100th birthday, the town of McCrory, a town of 1800, gave him a birthday party. Okay. 500 people showed up for his birthday party. He went to the party and then after the party was over, he went back to his office and saw 25 patients. 
<laughs> okay. He died at 104. Okay. Uh, these two men, Ryan and John William Morris, were poster boys for what? <clears throat> Country doctors, family doctors, and general practitioners are and should be and should be. There are very few times that you can date an age to a moment, to an instant, okay? But the modern age of country doctors began on April the 16th, 1948, at about noon, okay? At about noon time, the Arkansas Academy of General Practice was started that day. They, there were 22 interested physicians showed up. It was part of the Arkansas Medical Society meeting about forming an academy. There was already a national academy. These group of, this group of people became the, the 11th state chapter in the United States. Okay. The reason it was important is because since 1910, the medical school <clears throat> had been training specialists and they'd been training technology. And so what had happened is over a period of 20, 25 years, the number of country doctors had diminished, 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 and it got to the point where it was critical. In 1947, there was a study by Jerry Coddington from Fayetteville that showed that, that two thirds of the doctors in Arkansas were where one third of the population was, and that was city and they were mainly specialists. Okay. The guys who were still out there in the country were getting older and they were seeing fewer and fewer patients. Okay. These guys who started, Font Richardson from Fayetteville, R.B. Robbins from Camden, these people who started this organization then started working on getting training, training country doctors to go back to the country. Very interesting, very interesting point to me. Uh, and and they, it worked. Uh, you, you may or may not know the name of the AHEC program, Area Health Education Centers, okay? There's not any question that if you look at the reasons people go places, go to practice, okay? One is where were you born and raised? And number two is where did you, where were you educated? Okay. Uh, and what, ha what, what was happening was two thirds of the medical school classes at the university were from Little Rock. Okay. One third was from out of the state. The People's Act in 1947 said you can't do that. Okay. And so they said distribute it among all the people in the, in the state. So that the, the positions for the medical school. And that was the very first starting of this. The area health education programs came along in, in the family practice residencies and the area, area health education centers came along in the, in the late sixties, early seventies. <coughs> and they are responsible for an awful lot of the young doctors who are out there in the country. Mike, uh, Bursar is one of those guys. And if you ask any of these guys who taught in these area health education centers, they will say, my most important legacy is the guys I sent back out to practice in small towns. It's very interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, an interesting aspect, uh, and we don't think about this, and I'm on, I, I want to talk a little bit about Sid, Sid McMath. Okay. Uh, Y'all may know that in 1948, Sid McMath was a progressive and he ran on a platform of consolidating schools and improving education in Arkansas, improving roads in Arkansas and getting a new medical school built because that was the only way they were going to get any of these new doctors trained. They needed more slots for these doctors. So in 50 years, we had gone from being a doctor on a horseback and technology. So roads, okay. Ben Salzman was the head of the family practice center and he was head of the, the health department for a while back in the seventies. He says that <coughs> when he moved to mountain home in 1945, the only paved road in Baxter County, was the little street right around the courthouse in downtown Mount Hope. Okay. There were 24 to 25 counties in the state that did not have a road that connected with anything else in the state except the railroad. Okay. And so Sid McMath worked to try to make sure that you got 
that you had that you had road system. All right. If you were critically ill and it was beyond the capacity of your doctor to do anything about it, you had luck. You were really seriously out of luck. Uh, T. E. Ryan and Dr. Morris both tell the story about having a patient with appendicitis that they didn't feel comfortable operating on. And in both cases, Ryan, or T. E. Ryan was in Thornton, which is southwest of here. McCrory's northeast of here. They both put their patient on a train, got in the train with them, and went to Memphis. They didn't go to Little Rock. They went to because the train went to Memphis. Okay, but they went to Memphis to get their patient taken mm -hmm. care of, and then after the patient was better, they'd all come back. They'd all come back to either McCrory or Thornton. So it's really interesting. Uh, Bob Kerr, who went to practice in uh, Mountain Home in like 1962, he said there was no direct connection with any place in the state of Arkansas. Else, they just weren't they were gravel roads. I mean, there were gravel roads. And, and y'all may or may not remember this, but do you remember what the first ambulances were uh, in the 50s? The first modern ambulances were in the 50s and 60s. It was the hearse. Mm -hmm. It was the hearse from the funeral home. OK, there were no ambulances. There was no ambulance. There was no EMS. OK, and the and and what the interesting thing was that what what triggered the development of emergency medical services, ambulances, air ambulances, all these other kinds of things <clears throat> was the number of people who were getting killed on the highways in car wrecks. OK. And so when Medicare came along and Wilbur Mills had a lot to do with that, when, when Medicare came along in 65, part of Medicare was to pay for ambulance services. OK. And then ambulance services started to build up. I've, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself here, a little, but there are some other technologies that are very, very, that are really very important that go back. If you were a diabetic in 1946, 47, and you needed a blood sugar done, the only choice you had, unless you lived in a tertiary center with a great big hospital, and then it took four to five hours to get a blood sugar. Okay. The only, only way to get a blood sugar was uh, to check your urine. You could check your urine, but that gave a, uh, it was not what your blood sugar was right now. Ordinarily, when we do these talks, there's 30, 40 people in the room. And I'll look at the room and I'll sit there. Somebody in this room who has on a little patch on their side and you can pull your little dial and say, well, my blood sugar right now is 103. Okay. That's how technology has changed. It's not just that technology. It's all kinds of technology. If you ask the country doctors, what technology has changed the, their life the most, they will tell you the cellular telephone. Okay. Cause John, John Smith from, from Paris is a surgeon and he lives in Paris, Arkansas. And he said, he said, when he first started practicing, if he went fishing on the Arkansas river, he'd get out there and he, he had a beeper. He didn't have a cell phone. He had a beeper. And then he'd have to get out. He'd get, pull his boat back to the, back to the dock and go find a telephone somewhere and tell a nurse that yes, she could give an aspirin. <laughs> so the telephone really did have a big, big impact in the last two years, more so in the last two years because of COVID, but it's been going on for a lot longer than that, but it's really been more so. Uh, virtual visits, virtual this, okay. Uh, uh, electronic medical records, all of these things have had a major significant impact on the ability of a country doctor, a guy with all he needs is a laptop. Okay. And he has to figure out how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> this young man over here set it up for me. So I didn't have to figure out how to use this, but those pieces of technology are making dramatic changes in what goes on in a country doctor's office. Okay. I mean, there's really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, all of these technologies cost a ton of money. Okay. A solo practitioner practicing by himself is out of luck trying to buy and keep all this stuff updated, all the software, all the hardware, all those kinds of things. And so what has happened is 
We went from what, what we can remember from our childhood as a, a, a father and his son practicing medicine together, okay? And maybe some other guy over here on, the, on across the street who was the competition, okay? But they, they didn't have a lot of costs, okay? Even in today's, even in today's value, they wouldn't have had a lot of costs. That was not a lot of costs. But what has happened and what we're seeing increasingly, and I think it's a good thing, and I think most people do now, is the corporatization of medicine. We're seeing groups like Baptist Hospital and SVI and Charity and, and uh, uh, St. Edwards up in, up in, in, in uh, Fort Smith and, and the Baptist Hospital out of Memphis having a real impact on having a real impact on being able, being able to provide care in a real time for people who live in small towns, who don't have any resources, but they can do this. They don't have to be there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. In some cases they are, but you don't have to. Another, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna say, I'm an unashamed proponent of a fellow named Steve Collier, okay? Steve Collier created our care, okay? I don't know if y'all know this or not, living in Hot Springs, living in downtown Hot Springs, you don't see a need for this, but Steve and his our care organization provides care for people in 27 underserved counties in the state, okay? 10 counties in Western Kentucky and 10 counties in Northwestern Mississippi, underserved counties, okay? They provide care. They find a way to provide a doctor and or a nurse practitioner and or a physician assistant or somebody to help deliver care. They help develop uh, emergency services uh, for these small towns. Uh, very interesting. Steve is going to face a problem. Steve is facing a problem as time goes on. Okay, you take a little town like Cotton Plant, Arkansas. Okay, the, our care started up in Augusta. You might recognize that's where I was born and raised. And Cotton Plant is essentially not there anymore. There's not a, they don't have a, they don't have a school system. They don't have a grocery store. They have a little, very small, tiny library as a branch of one of the other libraries. And the question that's going to be for Steve and his group and people like him, there are five of these organizations around the state, is how long do you continue to provide services? when there's nobody there to provide services for. Very interesting, very, very interesting stuff. Uh, okay, I'm gonna back up just a little bit. I wanna talk about that just a little bit more. No, I'm, I'm gonna go forward, okay. In this, in this slide, this is a slide of, a, can I turn this, can I turn this? Okay. It's just a bunch of doctors, mm -hmm. okay. But it started out with the very first doctor, and I end up with the very, the youngest, okay? And the reason I want to show you that is because that's Steve Collier. And this is a, a lady from West Memphis, okay? And I have my mental blocking against her name now. But she runs East Arkansas Family Health, okay? There are 10 counties that face the Mississippi River in Arkansas, and they have the worst health outcomes in the United States. Okay, she has taken this, these counties on as a role for her. She's got an organization similar to our care. They're providing care in those 10 counties. Okay, so we're going to have, we're going to have, you know, because one of the questions, one of the questions I get asked regularly nowadays is, are we going to have country doctors in the future? And the answer is yes, without hesitation without any without any question we are, okay? As long as there are people in the country, there will be doctors in the country. Because these guys make the conscious decision to go back there. That's where they were born and raised. That's where they want, that's where they want to live, okay? Even, uh, again, I'll, I'll pull this around here. This doctor right here, <coughs> y'all probably don't recognize. You'll recognize his last name is Hertzberger. His name is John Hertzberger. John, was born and raised in Fordyce, Arkansas. He wanted to be a family doctor. He went to medical school, got completely enamored of surgery, then got completely enamored of cardiovascular surgery and became a cardiovascular surgeon, okay? And eventually he, he got tired of, he got tired of living in the city because he was from Fordyce. 
he went and talked to the administrator of the hospital at Nashville, who was just gleeful. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he moved to Nashville, Arkansas, where he practices general surgery. Found the only town of 3,000 people in the world with a qualified, successful cardiovascular surgeon. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't have a lot else to say about this except for one thing. As I go around the state, what I'm asking people to do is to tell me their doctor's stories. Okay. Because I want to write a companion book to Country Doctors of Arkansas and just tell me your doctor's story. The people telling me their stories. I want, I'm asking everybody to take this, that, that email address, that is my email address that I do answer. That's my telephone that I do answer. Okay. Uh, and send those to me. Go on your computer and record them. Okay. Record your stories. Because I want, you don't have to put any identifying information. Just send them to me. I want to write another book about telling me your doctor's stories because I think that's absolutely fascinating. I think it will be a great fun and I think everybody would really enjoy it. Now, that's really all I have to say. I hope I didn't talk too long. Okay. 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 Well, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, one of the questions I get regularly asked is, but you didn't mention doctor. <laughs> and that's true. I didn't, I don't mention a lot of doctors because I don't know anything about them. Okay. But there are so many of those guys. There are so many of those guys out there. Okay. That are doing this wonderful job and they're and it's not a job they're just part of the community they're very very much part mike verser is a great example he lives on a little creek he lives on a little creek between glenwood and mount ida and i think he's like a pig in heaven he just he just he just enjoys living there and that's true for most of these guys who are out there practicing in, in country doctors thank you yeah, thank you. Um, I want to encourage uh, our viewers to get in some questions while you still can. Uh, Dr. Taggart, uh, I just want to compliment you. You didn't look at your notes one time. <laughs> you, you, just, you just recited all of that from memory and experience. So, uh, very impressive. And you did get a couple of great uh, compliments from our viewers. Uh, Valerie says, this presentation is really grabbing my interest. Such interesting details together with broad perspectives. Tell her she can buy a copy of the book <laughs> at the at the Garland County Historical Society. Absolutely. And, and now it's my understanding you uh, sometimes do a three hour version of this program. I have a twenty minute version, a thirty minute, forty five minute version, and I don't know what I did then. And then I have a three hour version. Okay, mm -hmm. that can be viewed if anybody wants to see that. Okay, you know, you know how when you're you're a little kid. You always say, my daddy used to say, so you have some validity. Mm -hmm. Well, now I say my oldest son tells me, okay? Because my, son, my oldest son is a cultural anthropologist, okay? And he tells me, he said, Dad, you need to tell them who these people were, what they faced, what tools they had, and how they responded, okay? And that's the three-hour that's the three-hour version, okay? And it's, <laughs> it's, it's fun, but it's a little long. <laughs> So some other great compliments. Uh, John says, this is quite interesting. Thanks, Doc. Rita says, wonderful program. Thomas says, thanks. Very interesting. Gregory says, thanks. So shout out to all of you uh, viewers for watching. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what are some other frequently asked questions you get? Well, it's, it's kind of a question. <clears throat> it's kind of a follow-up to that question I started saying there just a minute ago. There has always been in the practice of medicine, and I believe this probably goes back to the Egyptians. Okay. The Egyptians had a specialist for everything. Okay. Now this is only for the emperors. People out there, regular people didn't have doctors. They're just, but they had a spe they had a specialist for every organ. Okay. Uh, the history of medicine is the history of the generalist. Okay. And there's always been a group out there who say, I know more than anybody else. And so you guys are a bunch of, a bunch of hacks. Okay. <clears throat> and when nurse practitioners or when osteopaths, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants came along, 
there was a group of people who said, oh, they're not going to be any good. That's silly. These people do a wonderful job. Do you know what these patients, when, 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 a, when, a, when a patient goes in to see a nurse practitioner in a small clinic out in the country, you know what they call that nurse practitioner? Doc. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because they trust them. They trust them to be wise. They trust them to be there and to do what they're supposed to do. And that's the most important thing. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> the osteopaths, uh, the osteopaths and the medicine people had a fight for, for, oh, well, it went on until at least the 1950s and 60s. Okay. But nobody, I mean, everybody knows the osteopaths are an osteopath, is just like an MD. It's the same thing. Okay. And so we're getting beyond that. But now I will tell you what's going to happen is I, what I think is going to happen is that uh, these people who take the place of, of these other people are then will say, no, well, they're not near as good as we are. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's just human beings. That's just human beings. Sometimes you'll, you'll see on TV jokes at country doctor's expense. Like the country doctor is also the local vet or takes care right. of horses. Is there any truth to that? Not in my experience, uh, not in my experience on a regular basis. Okay. <clears throat> I did run into a couple of country doctors who are absolutely love their animals. Okay. And I suspect they practice a little veterinary medicine. I won't name any names. <laughs> I, su I suspect that they practice a little veterinary medicine. Now, if you look back at the 19th century, okay. Uh, the doctor was the dentist. He was the pharmacist. He was the veterinarian. Okay. And he was all the other things. Okay. So yeah, th yeah, I suspect it's, I suspect that's true. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think of any other questions I get asked other than, but you didn't talk about my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a cute one. And I just smile at him and say, well, it's just because I didn't know about it. <laughs> but then I asked them, I turned it back around. That's how this started about tell me your doctor stories. I, I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. You tell me your doctor stories. Tell me about Dr. Hurd. Tell me about uh, Dr. Jones. Tell me about Dr. McGuire. Uh, I want to know about these people. And if they lose your email address, they can send them to the Garland County Historical sure. Society through our website and I'll forward them to right, you. Right, right. I'll give you a handful of cards if you want me to. You can put it with the books, okay? Uh, Andrew, do you have any questions? Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is great. As you can tell, I just enjoy the hell out of this. Yeah. <laughs> this is great fun. This is great fun to do. Uh, we're so grateful yeah. that you came and gave this wonderful talk. And I can't imagine anybody who doesn't have a doctor story. I can't either. Well, I'll make a couple of announcements of the pr programs. Uh, we have here. Uh, there's another live stream this evening featuring Marcellus Weatherspoon with the local NAACP. And this yesterday was Martin Luther King Day. Uh, ton tonight's program with Marcellus will uh, take a look at MLK uh, featuring a guest from the uh, MLK Hot Springs Committee. And also, as Liz Robbins mentioned earlier, she will be on our uh, live stream again next week with Charlie Moore of the Arkansas Highlands Folk Project, and she'll be joining uh, her uh, a, a close uh, equivalent over in Mount Ida, Barry Mickey, who's the director of the Heritage House Museum, and they'll be talking about old time music of both Garland and Montgomery County. So uh, tune in tonight and next Tuesday for those upcoming programs. And um, it looks like we did just get uh, a, a nice uh, story in um, Dr. Taggart. Uh, Lisa says, thank you so much. I grew up in Thornton. Dr. Ryan delivered my aunts and uncle. He was truly an amazing man. Loved growing up, hearing all the stories. All right. Well, once again, uh, th thank you, everyone, you. For, for, for tuning in um, and watching. And uh, this program, uh, this broadcast is available on Facebook and YouTube. So please share that with, uh, so, so those who weren't able to watch live can 
check it out. And uh, or if you tuned in late and want to watch the beginning, uh, check out that broadcast. Thank you.